Thank you, Ellie. Um, just wanted to, to echo on to it. Um, there are over 30 plus tropical visions in the 2008 Farm Bill. Um, just discussing um, a number of things that she mentioned and things that, that are still out there. For me, it looked like it was made for us as tribal governance selects in our sovereignty. And so uh, one of the things that we're concentrating on today would be the end discussion, but we were looking forward to digging into all the other tribal provisions that we can directly benefit and that will help our program, our services, and our tribal citizens. So uh, I do like the, uh, the, the provisions in the, the 2018 Farm Bill. So let's jump over to, to Hemp 101. I do want to uh, uh, take you back onto a little bit of the history. Uh, hemp has been around for a number of years. Um, it is, as Ellie mentioned, new, but hemp is not new. Hemp ha has been here. Um, we have utilized the products in World War II. Um, it has been used for many, many things, and I'll get to that later in, in, in my discussion points, but I wanted to to also highlight, uh, we, we talked to you talked about it's no longer it, it's not, it's no longer illegal, it's legal, but it was in 1970, under all forms of cannabis, including hemp, was scheduled a class, a scheduled one drug, making it illegal to grow hemp in the United States. Congress passed that in 1970, um, making it a, 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 a scheduled one drug um, under the controlled substance acts in 1970. So since 1970, it's been illegal to grow in the United States. It's been you know, imported from from Canada, from China. Um, those are things that we're looking at. And what we mentioned earlier, we talked about the 2018 Farm Bill, but there was a 2014 Farm Bill that was passed by Congress and signed by President Obama that, that included the research of industrial hemp to be grown for research and development, which was not included in the 2014 Farm Bill, was tribal governments. Mm -hmm. We were never included in any of that bill. And so that's why I'm, I'm excited of all the provisions in this 2018. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And, and I know it, it was a, it's no longer just to bounce around a little bit. Um, hemp. It is cannabis. Marijuana is also cannabis. They're, they are the same bound, but they are different. Um, and I encourage all our tribal members and citizens to do that research through their peers online and Google. I spend roughly about a, a couple hours overnight, every night, just to place myself in the middle of the road and to look at both sides of it. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, the hemp, we start from the ground, the stock uh, is the fiber, uh, is made out of many things that we use, um, clothing, um, paper, um, I think the list goes on and on. Um, so, but I wanted to enclose that hemp is, is not marijuana. And I, I wanted to repeat that hemp is not marijuana. And I encourage our tribal citizens to do that research with either peers or online. Um, there are two types of cannabis. One is a psychoactive and non-psychoactive. Hemp is non-psychoactive. Hemp can produce a lot of products, but it cannot get you hot. And again, I want to go back to encourage our tribal citizens to do their own research. Um, also with the new the 2018 Farm Bill, as, as Ellie mentioned, hemp cannot contain more than 0.3% of THC. Hemp is now legal in the United States for strict restrictions of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, it's very similar to the regulation and the guidelines of gaming as a compliance. You've got to have a hemp commissioner. You've got to have somebody there to uh, validate your books and your inventory. It is very strict guidelines. And, uh, I, I welcome that, that approach. I think it's good knowing that we are a natural resource and environmental tribe. We should not ask for anything less regarding our, our environment. I wanted to talk a little about the, uh, the hemp seed. Uh, it, was a, it was very interesting last night. I was telling my peer, Council Member Aubrey, uh, 
a couple a couple hours online as you more and more dig into it. Um, hemp seed was can be pressed and made into oil. Hemp seed can be used as salad dressing, paint, ink, and as a core ingredient in many body core products. The nut of the seed itself could be used for bread, granola, cereal, milk, dairy products, and protein powders. I wanted to talk about the hemp stalks I mentioned a little earlier. If you compare the hemp stalk to its fellow cousin that's out there is marijuana, hemp stalk produces over 20,000 products that can be used. Uh, the fiber and stalks of hemp are used for clothing, construction material, paper, biofuel, plastic, composites, bags, rope, netting, canvas, and carpet. Um, if you actually cut it in half to the core of, of the stock, hemp stock is used for cement, installation, paper, pulp, and biodegradables, and plastic. So it, 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 it's, very, it's very interesting to look at the history of hemp, whether it's in World War I, World War II, up to the point um, it was used in a lot in, in our livelihoods. Um, we have many products here today on the table over there. We also have some products up here that were made out of the fiber, the clothing, the oils. And so I, I encourage uh, people in the room after the meeting is, is to work around and look at all the products that are here in front of us. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'd like to, to hand it over to uh, Vice Chair Myers to talk about the so I just want to give a, a brief overview of the ordinance. I believe we, we have some here today. Uh, one of the, there were many exciting things about the farm that came out. The opportunity for the tribe to participate in him as a part of agriculture it was very exciting. Uh, for me, what, what I found the most interesting part about the farm bill and, and the most exciting part uh, about the hemp industry in particular is it allows the tribe uh, regulatory authority and this is this is key for us uh, for the past decade and a half uh, the tribe has been uh, in pursuit of protecting our cultural and environmental resources from the degradation that's, that's occurred uh, regarding the illegal cannabis cultivation that's been occurring on the tribe's ancestral territory within our reservation boundaries uh, i've been a part of the the Operation Yurok since accession, and I've also been a part of the Yurok Tribe Cannabis Task Force, which was uh, a delegated authority to specifically look at the, uh, those regulatory matters when it came, came to the county. Uh, and having uh, worked with the county and with the tribe through this process, uh, one of the things that became apparent uh, is if you're not the ones writing the rules, uh, then you are the ones uh, being told what is going to happen uh, to you. And I think the Farm Bill uh, opens up and allows the tribe to really assert uh, its self-governance and assert its regulatory jurisdiction, uh, not only within the, the reservation boundaries, but within our territories. Uh, one of the things that I've been talking to folks about as we have been going, going around and, and uh, talking to members for me, whether you agree with hemp cultivation, whether you disagree with hemp cultivation, whether you think we should be growing thousands of acres or we should be growing zero, uh, either sign that you're on, uh, I think you, to me, you need to be supporting this action that the tribal council is doing, uh, supporting the regulatory authority of the tribe, asserting our uh, jurisdiction. And I say that because if we don't move forward on this, then we will be being told what's going to happen within our reservation and what's going to happen within our ancestral territory. If we don't create the laws, Humboldt County and the state of California will tell us what's going to happen. And we're going to be going along for the ride again, just like we did uh, through the Humboldt County's uh, cannabis land use ordinance. And so I think that's one of the drivers I wanted to push forward. Uh, we're also going to be having our your camp ordinance hearings. Uh, we did pass the, the ordinance um, through an emergency action that part of the farm bill uh, process is to submit a hemp plan to the USDA uh, for review. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we 
got our uh, him plan in early to begin the review process in case there was any um, changes that need to happen at the federal level, we'd be able to give a, give a heads up. But I wanted to also let folks know that the hemp ordinance is also a little lightened in how we're looking at processing all tribal ordinances. It's, it is a fairly thin packet. Um, I think it's eight or nine pages. You can read it fairly quickly. It's if you're if you've read other tribal ordinances, um, this will come as, as maybe a surprise about the length of it. Uh, most of our ordinances are are fairly um, <laughs> robust. Thank you. Are fairly robust. I think one of the things we're trying to change uh, as a tribal government is, is streamlining our our ordinances and making them easy for folks to understand and to read, and then coming up with the supporting documentation for the, the policies and procedures. And so we took that new approach for this hemp ordinance, only including in the hemp ordinance those specific sections that are called out in the farm bill. So we didn't want to put more in the ordinance than we absolutely had to. So it's a very streamlined ordinance compared to the rest of our ordinances, and it covers those sections that are mandated in the farm bill to cover. What will come along with this and what we should really be thinking about as far as comments and concerns with the, the, the hemp ordinance are the policies and procedures that go along with it. Uh, and the main difference between a, an ordinance and a, and a policy is a structure of which you can change uh, those two documents. Uh, ordinance is a lengthy process to change um, and it is fairly difficult to move through. Uh, policies and procedures are much easier to change and much easier to react to changing um, uh, opinions or, or climates or, or shifting regulatory authorities. And so this hemp ordinance is, is, is clean, it is simplified, and it is just the basis of what uh, we absolutely needed to. Some of the comments we had heard about the hemp ordinance before, um, you know, there was a lot of questions, you know, where are the, the cultural... Uh, protections in the hemp ordinance, where the water protections in the hemp ordinance, where the, the pesticide protections in the hemp ordinance, and, and I made those statements before to make this one. Uh, the Europe tribe has also done a phenomenal job of creating a series of protection ordinances that protect our cultural resources, our water resources, uh, our environmental resources. We have a series of ordinances that governs those practices. All of those apply to any individual within the jurisdiction of the Europe time. They all would apply to this hemp ordinance. And so uh, with the thought process that there's there's no need to uh, reinvent the wheel or to create more uh, in the document than we need to, we kept it clean and made sure that we tied back to the other ordinances that do apply. And so if you're looking at the hemp ordinance and you're, you're wondering where is the cultural resources section, um, it's in the cultural resources ordinance. And if you're wondering where is the land management section, it's in the land management ordinance. And if, you, if you're questioning why isn't there more water protections, it's because we have a whole ordinance that deals directly with those. And they are tied into this ordinance. And so that was a lot of the feedback we, uh, we got originally when we um, passed this out. I think we do have quite a bit of work to do um, in fulfilling all of the, the obligations of, of both the, the 2018 Farm Bill and our own uh, constitutional mandates as far as the policies and procedures, but uh, I do feel like we have uh, a good basis to work off of and we'll be working through that. Uh, we'll be having hearings coming up fairly quickly within the next month to uh, take specific comments uh, on the hemp uh, ordinance itself, but I would like for folks to keep that in mind as you review the hemp ordinance and as you look through it, the questions, uh, protection measures or others, uh, why they're not in there, these are the reasons they're in there. Um, and then further now, uh, looking at the, the ordinance, you'll see that it is it is what the federal government absolutely mandated to try to submit, which is what we submitted. Thank you, Vice Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's jump into the potential business opportunities. We do have two potential pilot project uh, business opportunities that, is, that have been presented to council. Uh, council is, is full aware of, of both of these business opportunities. Um, we will I'll tackle the, uh, the C1 vice chair. We can tackle the uh, one here in Plymouth. With, uh, so let, let me jump into the C1. Uh, 
Nothing has been finalized as a contract. It's supposed to be a discussion, a uh, good discussion. We've met uh, these, this, this company probably about three or four times. A lot, of, a lot of vetting has to be done, a lot of research. Again, as we mentioned, we're, we're uh, environmental stewards of our land. So anybody that wants to do business with us has to align with our core mission and our values that we have set in place. Uh, with that being said, we have been in a discussion with a humble seed company. Uh, they have been in the business for quite a while. They are more on the, the, the marijuana side, but we are looking to the hemp side. He is looking to see if there's a partner opportunity to partner with us with to produce uh, seeds and distribute hemp seeds across the United States. That's one thing good about the farm bill is now it's legal, you can also transfer across the United States. Um, I'd like to, Javier, can you pass this up to the membership? That's a, I have a sample, and these are hemp seeds. If you want to look at it. I have a couple more up here. So these are in small packages, but we're looking to sell those by the pounds. We're looking to sell those by the pound. Um, what we would do in entail is look at uh, creating an area that is suitable, that can basically be in compliance with the number of ordinances and, and, and policies that we have in place. Uh, what that would entail is looking to grow the hemp to produce the seeds, uh, and then to be able to transport those across the United States. There's a high demand uh, knowing that the 2018 regulations of the farm bill is going to come out really soon, and we are being proactive, we want to be on the front end of it. Not just the, the regs are approved, now let's go do the plan. We have always had the vision, let's get in front of it, and now we have a potential business opportunity that could provide jobs to our members, that could provide jobs to our, our economic development. We are in Working closely with our economic development, we are working closely with our our cultural resource team, our legal team, our council on, on this business event. And again, we're we're in uh, in discussions with them, but we want to make sure we're transparent and letting our membership know what we're looking at. Um, we're looking at the risk versus the reward. We're looking at startup capital costs. We're looking at. Uh, gross net revenue that come back to us. We're looking at the number of jobs. Um, and what we're looking at the potential pilot project, if it doesn't work out, we can both walk away from it. But there is no contract signed yet. Uh, we're exchanging information. But it, out there, what I handed out is, is what the, the hemp seeds would look like. More in quantity. Uh, we're looking like 20 pound bags to distribute uh, across the United States. One seed ranges, the cost for one of those seeds right now is a dollar to five dollars. That's the price that for, I'd say take it on the low end, let's say we want to sell um, conservative, two dollars a seed. Um, count that by a million seeds that we can produce and ship across the United States. Um, you, can, you can do the math, that's the money that we don't have. Um, so that's an opportunity that we can provide to our our economic development, our travel citizens, and job opportunities. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity that we're looking and weighing and, and, and taking a serious consideration. With that said, uh, Vice Chair, sure you want to talk about Papa Barkley? So the, the other uh, kind of pilot project we were looking at in the proposal that was brought to the, the tribe, one of them was a partnership with Papa Barkley. They do uh, processing. Right now they currently are, are licensed under California to do cannabis processing uh, for CBD and THC product, products. I think one of the things um, that has kind of found in our research that we've done um, so far is we've tried to look at the industry as a whole, the hemp industry as a whole, and look at the, the paths that right off the bat um, seem least likely to have a negative impact on our cultural and environmental resources. And then once we kind of narrow the focus down a little bit, uh, we started beginning to look at which aspects of those paths make sense. The two that kind of popped out at, at first was uh, seed cultivation because of the low impact. Uh, the other one was processing. Uh, Pop and Barkley uh, met with Tribal Council on several occasions. 
Uh, they met with us. We, we did a walkthrough of our facility in Klamath, and we did several walkthroughs of their facility to make sure what they were telling us was actually true uh, on the ground. And some of the things that really, I think, stood up, stood up in my head uh, for this partnership is the current use of a facility we own um, that's not being um, uh, optimized currently. Uh, we have a, uh, the facility could be easily converted uh, to hemp processing, uh, as well as the other thing that really stuck out in my head was the, uh, the water issues coming from environmental resource background, you know, my concern is always about the protection of our, of our water. Uh, and given the proposal we, we were shown, there was a zero water take for the production of, of, of the hemp processing that they would do on the reservation. I think that was, that was really big for me. Uh, the fact that we wouldn't be adding any additional footprint to our landscape was also uh, a big plus for me. On the flip side, I think the tribe also understands the, the benefit that we bring to any partnership, because we're a tribe, uh, there are certain tax incentives uh, that allow businesses to come on and be successful on the reservation. I think making sure that we are clear with what we're bringing to the table is extremely important in how we negotiate with any of the proposals we do. So we're not we're not going into any of these relationships blind. We understand that um, at the end of the day, the day this is business. Um, they will make a profit. Uh, we will also make a profit, but we need to uh, be clear about what it is we uh, keep for our core values and what we bring to the table. Uh, the processing plant looks to be making CBD oil. Uh, the company already has uh, cultivation fields and uh, packaging and delivery methods and other facilities. So we would become, uh, if we want to move forward, we become like the, the, the middle, kind of the middleman. And I think. Uh, the other part of the research we've done is, is historically in the natural resources and, and business, we have been on the harvest side of the industry and we have let someone else come and be the middleman to distribution and marketing. And we are trying to change that dynamic. The majority of the profits come um, in the middle, not in the direct harvest. And so looking at this and seeing how can we be strategic about how we enter this, this is a strategic way for us to enter. We can enter it uh, where the the gross profit is the, is the highest and the net profit is the highest. And this is one of the areas that um, if we want to move forward with this uh, company, we'd be in a, in a very good position. Um, I think we are also at the point with both of these proposals, and we talked we talked about this yesterday in our in our retreat. Is we are trying to uh, do a balancing act between doing research and investigating possible business opportunities and making sure that in the membership is involved. And so I think we're right in the middle of having done some research to have an intelligent conversation, but not far enough to really be able to answer some of the, the nuts and bolts questions of how the business would, would go. And so there's there is no formal agreement with either one of them. We've, we've signed no contracts to to date, and so some specifics that individuals may want to know, we don't have them because we haven't quite gone down that, that, that path yet. And what I do want to add on to, we probably had over a dozen meetings of uh, <coughs> range from Southern California to uh, Las Vegas with, with other tribes that have been, been in the, the field of whether it's retail, whether it's manufacturing or processing, some tribes are using cultivation, one of the things that I, I want to zero back to is is the manufacturing processing, <clears throat> and and the full disclosure we did we were looking at the other dish plant in Clown as a, as a possibility. We did a couple walkthroughs there, um, and again as we did a walkthrough there in in Eureka um, first because our you know our worries always go up, and so after we did our research and have a, a number of meetings. Um, in res, the reservation is the Reservation Economic Summit in Vegas. You meet a lot of people that are business doing some, you talk to some tribes up there in Washington and Oregon that's been doing this for a while. Um, so we, we really did our, our due diligence of, of, of homework that we're, we're doing. And and I don't think large scale is ever in our our minds. Uh, like I said, we've got offers, that's thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. 
no, that's that's not us. That's I don't see that could ever be us um, because they're looking at growing fields of, of hemp, i.e., similar to corn, whether it's Iowa, or Kentucky. But that's that's not us. Um, and so, uh, but I wanted to, to fully uh, provide that information to the membership. Uh, one of the things I, I want to highlight too, or Secretary, want to make sure you. Can uh, state is whatever partnership we move forward on, whatever business, if we choose to move forward, um, all of our partners going forward uh, would always be under the jurisdiction of the tribe. We would always have to follow all of the ordinances of the uh, of the Yurok tribe. And so that was one of the things that uh, you know, looking at the ordinance, looking at the possible business um, potentials, is making sure that at the end of the day, if the pilot project doesn't work out, if the business doesn't work out. Uh, that we can halt it and, and keep our, our reservation and our accessible territory safe. And, and the provision um, that allows for that is in the hemp ordinance that, that uh, says that all of our business partners will be governed by the jurisdiction of the, the Yurok tribe. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add to that, Chair. Sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, one thing that I would like to add um, in the discussion with. Um, that we have regarding the fish plant. Um, we are a natural resource tribe and our land and water is very important to us. And so one of the questions I did ask um, the company when they were making the presentation was um, just how would it affect you know, our river, especially with the location that, that is there. And so one of the things that they assured us is that there, you know, 